Hello, I'm Michael Manier with the Pacific Salmon Foundation. Thanks for joining us for another edition of Salmon Matters. This is a partnership with Conversations That Matter, bringing interesting and innovative ideas around wild salmon to the community. Today, I'm really pleased to be joined by Bill Collins. He's the chairman of Cascadia Seaweed, and he's also a founder of the Pacific Seaweed Growers Association. Bill, welcome to Salmon Matters. Thanks, Mike. It's great to be here. Bill, tell us a little bit about yourself, your career. We're going to talk today about seaweed and salmon, but uh, tell us about your your career and your connection to salmon. Yeah, I'm a marine geologist by training, so I spent uh, many years in international science uh, doing seafloor mapping and uh, really trying to get an understanding globally of the importance of uh, coastal sediments in our ecosystem, in our coastal ecosystem. And as, because of that background, I had an opportunity to connect with the Peninsula Stream Society here on Vancouver Island, southern Vancouver Island, who really have it at their mandate to, to enhance uh, the streams that exist uh, on the peninsula here in support of, of all waterway uh, ecosystem services, but particularly salmon. And so as a result of that, uh, that uh, relationship, I became part of and led a group of local residents in converting what was a Class A federally contaminated uh, waterway, uh, one of the local bigger streams on the peninsula here. Uh, we, we pushed government through uh, seven years of ad advocacy to remediate. And uh, last year we had the, the pleasant success of bringing all folks together, municipal, uh, federal and provincial, to take uh, many hundreds of, uh, of uh, cubic meters of cadmium laced sediment out of the stream wow. and return it to as close as we can get to its natural uh, natural beauty. And we're already beginning to see the uh, salmon come back, birds come back, riparian right. vegetation is returning. It's a beautiful story. And that's my connection recently with salmon. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, and Peninsula Stream Keepers, one of our longtime partners there in the Saanich Peninsula. We've funded through our Community Salmon Grant Program. That's really the power of volunteers. We give a buck and then the local groups turn it into six or seven, and, and a lot of that's through the power of volunteerism. So uh, I'm glad we could share a bit of that story with us today. Uh, I've gotten to know you and a little bit more about the potential for seaweed uh, aquaculture through some conversations that we have had. Tell us about uh, how you transitioned into the seaweed aqu aquaculture industry. That's a fairly recent thing and, and, and kind of the context for, for sea seaweed aquaculture in, in BC and, and Canada. Well, uh, it's been an interesting journey. Uh, I uh, have a, a marine le or a, a, um, a train electronics manufacturing firm, and I stepped aside a few years ago uh, to explore other things and get back to my oceanic roots, if you might say. Uh, so in so doing, I took a contract from the Vancouver Island Economic Alliance to explore opportunities for Vancouver Island and British Columbia in, in um, attracting foreign direct investment for businesses for which coastal BC has a natural competitive advantage. And we started with a clean slate of about 50 opportunities. We boiled it down to four, including clean tech, cultural tourism and value added uh, logging and, and uh, dimensional wood and such things, value added wood products. One of the things that we looked at as a possibility to attract foreign direct investment was aquaculture. Now, uh, the challenge with aquaculture, as you are more than aware, is if you were living in South Korea and had money to invest in natural resources in Canada and you Googled uh, British Columbia and aquaculture, you would uh, be mired in the, in the discussion that's ongoing and will continue to be ongoing for some time. However, uh, it did attract uh, a big number in terms of, of revenue and support for local communities and for local industry. So when we peeled back the onion one layer, we found this leg of aquaculture that was seaweed cultivation. And it, in, in North America, and in, in fact, in the, in the context of the Western world, it's a relatively new uh, option. Uh, it's been done in, in uh, Asia for many, many years. In fact, we mm -hmm. collaborate with a farm that's 300 years old in Japan. So when we looked at it, uh, we thought, okay, here's an opportunity to, to grow a foodstuff that's loaded with nutrition, 
at the same time as uh, uh, provide an opportunity to do something positive for the climate because seaweed cultivation is carbon negative. It is a net positive activity uh, in the coastal zone. And when you look at the intersection of food security and climate positive or climate action, and you also look at the opportunity for coastal community revitalization, then you have uh, three checks uh, in, in three boxes that are very, very important. So that's where we started on our journey of becoming okay. the largest cultivator of, uh, of ocean cultivated seaweed in North America. I've, I've done some reading on this, listened to some podcasts on it, and, and seaweed aquaculture and seaweed really seems to be kind of touted as almost the silver bullet that, that could be great for climate reduction, but it's a, a source of nutrition it can be used as an alternative for, for plastics, cosmetics. Uh, I've seen some material about uh, uh, feed, feed for cattle and, and, and reduction of carbon in that context. So, and plus the, the, the ocean health in general. Tell us in particular, uh, for the salmon audience, why seaweed aquaculture and a future for that industry here in BC would be particularly good in the salmon context. Uh, thanks, Mike. Uh, both you and I'll agree there's no such thing as a silver bullet. Uh, <laughs> True. But, but perhaps if we took some of that silver and applied it to the opportunity for seaweed cultivation, we will make a positive step forward. Uh, so in the context of salmon, uh, we look at uh, seaweed cultivation uh, in a number of ways. Uh, first of all, in the immediate sense, by putting uh, more in the water uh, than was there before, I'm talking specifically about growing species of seaweed native to this coast, but perhaps lacking now due to warming waters and, and climate change in general. So we have a chance to put back some of the habitat that formed uh, a, an important part, we believe, uh, of, uh, of salmon habitat through its life cycle. Uh, by growing uh, seaweed in areas that are close to streams. Now, you have to be careful because seaweed doesn't like fresh water. So it has a tendency to avoid these freshwater plumes that will move from creeks, particularly in, in spring during freshet. So there is areas that seaweed wouldn't naturally grow anyway because of that condition. But in general, as most leave, uh, leave the rivers and make their way into the great white, uh, wide world of, of uh, planet ocean, uh, seaweed uh, farms can provide, we believe, an opportunity for refugia and maybe in support of, uh, of the salmon's diet, or at least maybe the diet uh, in terms of prey that, that they may uh, feed on, but that likes the, 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 what, what seaweed cultivation or seaweed beds in general have to offer. So first and foremost, it may be a, a healthy place for a salmon to begin its ocean life and reduce the opportunities for other things that might predate on the salmon or otherwise cause it to be less uh, robust as it as it goes to the great white great wide world, as I said. So that's yeah. where it, that's where it begins. Okay, great. And and my understanding is there are essentially two ways to to farm seaweed. You can do it on long lines in a in an ocean uh, marine environment, and this is what you're talking about, obviously, in terms of uh, refugia for salmon, which is critical. We've lost so much of our underwater forestation, kelp and eelgrass. We've done research on this with the University of Victoria with satellite imagery and remarkable to see over time the loss of this critical habitat. But that's one way is, is on lines and then I believe the other way is actually uh, in a closed circulation uh, land-based uh, pools essentially. Is, is that the way this is done? Today, that is the way this is done. Uh, if we're talking about seaweed that you would grow and harvest, uh, we, can, we should talk uh, before we leave about opportunities for growing seaweed for the sole purpose of reforestation. Great. Uh, well, let's do that now. Other... Yeah. Oh, sure. Talk well, about I know... that now, please. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> uh, there's been some work done by Professor Louis Drool at Banfield Marine Science Center and OceanWise, uh, you'll know OceanWise, a, a great uh, conservation organization of uh, which Cascadia is a partner, and some, some recent science uh, that looks at the deployment of, we'll call green gravel, I think that's what they're, they're talking about. It. So you, you, you create a media 
uh, on which that, that's a biodegradable media into which you can imp implant uh, uh, seaweed babies, uh, spores, uh, or maybe young seedlings, and you throw them off uh, a back of a boat and you sprinkle them off a back of a boat and they become the media on which perhaps uh, next generations of kelp beds can come. But you're basically like sowing uh, wild seeds or seeds of wildflower. You can do the same with seaweed. Now, this research is in its infancy, um, and, and uh, you know, uh, please, I would encourage listeners to reach out to either D Professor Drool or OceanWise for more information, and I'm not sure where they are with uh, releasing the, the work of the first science or the goals of that, that science, but that's exciting because, because every time you, you help nature by putting an opportunity for seaweed to grow in the water, you're putting back what we have lost. And that's the climate action and climate positivity that comes from most aspects of seaweed cultivation. I'll tell you, Mike, um, one thing that we, we, we should understand and make clear. First of all, seaweed cultivation is building biomass. It's not extracting existing biomass. And that stands uh, opposite to seaweed harvesting, of which uh, the province licenses, licenses under strict management rules um, seaweed harvesting. Uh, that's not Cascadia's role. Our, our role is to put biomass into the ocean, to leave some of it there. Uh, and we can talk about the, the ecosystem services that are provided and the carbon sequestration yeah. opportunities. Please. But essentially, uh, we, we are different where we are adding to the biomass and hopefully we're replacing or replenishing the biodiversity. The oceans, of, we've lost about 50% of the biodiversity of the oceans. And organizations such as uh, Oceans 2050 recognize this and are working very diligently to try and re repopulate that diversity as much as we can. Uh, your listeners may, be, may have heard this comment before, but, but in terms of carbon, and, and I'll tell you a little bit about that, in terms of carbon, our goal is to decarbonize the atmosphere and recarbonize the biosphere to change that balance and seaweed cultivation we believe contributes to that so if you don't mind let's talk a second or yeah. two about carbon sequestration please uh, so uh, you might have your listeners may have heard about things such as the blue economy or blue carbon uh, which is is a really a recognition of the contribution of certain species in uh, in sustaining or improving the carbon balance and those quite specifically if you talked about the un compact on uh, uh for for um for environment they'll see eelgrasses and seagrasses and mangroves uh, largely sort of mid-latitude kinds of uh of organ um, of organisms yet we do see tons of seagrass around here in coastal bc so uh in in trying to address uh, that blue economy or blue carbon, if we look at the sediment makeup, for example, of eelgrasses around here in BC. Well, if you, if you looked deeply, you would see that a, a portion of the sediment is made up of macroalgae bits, in other words, seaweeds. So it's really tough to disassociate mangroves and eelgrasses from the macroalgae that grows in the coastal zone. So there's been work, science uh, is pointing to uh, the uh, when you when seaweed grows, it takes up CO2 at a rate some say 20 times more than terrestrial greens. Wow! So that's a big number. Uh, if you if you created kelp forests, uh, and you only have to look to Oceanwide's sea forestation project to look at their goals, then you you are giving nature an opportunity to to capture that carbon. As the uh, seaweed grows in its growth cycle, it sloughs off portions which fall to the seabed. Some of it gets repurposed by organisms living in and on the, sea, on the seabed. Others just ends up in the deep ocean, like most sediments end up in the deep ocean to be uh, either set there as, uh, as permanent carbon sequestered in the deep ocean, mm -hmm. or uh, in terms of uh, like a, as, um, a ra the range like a the geology of coastal British Columbia, where we're in a subduction zone and a lot of those sediments end up in the, the earth, deeper in the earth. So we have an opportunity through, seabed, through, through seaweed cultivation to sequester carbon. The question is how much? Hmm. Uh, because we plant seaweed, we, we outplant it on our lines and then we harvest it. So we're removing 
uh, but how much seaweed sloughs to the ocean floor during that growth cycle. That will help determine how much seaweed cultivation can contribute to permanent sequestration if we're harvesting. There's a school of thought and a TED talk your listeners may be interested in. Mm -hmm. uh, for the life, I can't remember the fellow, I want to say Tim Flanagan, oh, who okay. talked about uh, being, if you had six times the size of Australia growing as a seaweed firm, you would eliminate uh, GHG problems. My God, remarkable. So, yeah, it's, it's a wonderful thought. Will it ever get there? Who knows? Yeah. But each journey starts with that first step. And that's what we're trying to do is put in place the science and engineering uh, married with, with the economics of business uh, and business in the coastal zone and coastal communities executing this business yeah. and then addressing a worldwide demand for seaweed products. That's what we're about and that's what, Cas that's what drives Cascadia's uh, team members. Well, you've, you've hit on a really important topic that we talk a lot about at the Salmon Foundation. That is really the, the more uh, pan-global context. And uh, we do have the UN uh, Oceans Program coming for, I think it's the next decade, which is a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, certainly as we think about salmon, uh, our fish that, that grow in our streams and rivers head out through the Salish Sea and then out to the open ocean in the Pacific, and they're intermingling with uh, fish from Russia, Japan, Korea, Alaska, uh, throw in the, the hatchery production challenges of many of those countries over producing uh, hatchery fish. All this just to agree with you that this is really a global context. And as I've been doing some reading on the seaweed aquaculture, it looks like uh, Australia in particular and, and, and there are other jurisdictions where, where there is a lot of innovation going on. Is, is that innovation uh, connected? Are people talking to each other, learning from each other? Are there lessons that, that you're taking here in this industry in BC? Uh, you know, you, the research, for example, how, how strong has the research been elsewhere on the carbon sequestration piece? Uh, so everybody and their dog are trying to get into the carbon business yeah. uh, because there's a lot. I mean, uh, if you look at some big, big companies, the Microsofts of the world, for example, they all want to become carbon neutral. If they're not likely to get it in their business, their goal is to buy offsets from other businesses to, to, to in general, uh, mitigate their carbon footprint. So the carbon business is growing. It's big as governments uh, come together and decide on mechanisms, economic me mechanisms to trade in carbon. Uh, and if governments like the government of Canada are putting a price on carbon, which is really important in our opinion, uh, to deliver the economics, then, then we stand a real good chance at taking uh, up ideas like seaweed cultivation and going beyond the ecosystem services into a more of a, a global understanding of how it can help the planet. We talk literally every day to somebody, another seaweed cultivator or somebody wishing to do seaweed cultivation globally. You mentioned Australia. We were on the phone last week to the state of South Australia who really tout themselves as the seaweed capital of the world in terms of seaweed business and economics. They're reaching out all across the world to find like-minded uh, uh, business that understand the economics and they understand the science and technology surrounding seaweed cultivation. Australians have a very big outreach program. Very few conversations in the last uh, 18 to 24 months that we have had uh, have resulted in somebody not wanting to tell us their story or resulting in us not telling our st story to them. It's a very open and inclusive environment and it has to be that way. In North America, we will not meet the demand, which is, you know, uh, 8 to 14 percent growth in seaweed. There was 8,000 tons of seaweed imported into North America in 2019. Hmm. Uh, in 2019, that same year, North America produced about 300. So the opportunity hmm. is huge. If we do it correctly, the economics will work, and that will only help uh, the, a, hol a holistic view of our coastal ocean, and that will only help salmon. So uh, in addition to carbon, for example, by growing seaweed, you're improving the water quality, you're reducing ocean acidification, which is really important. There's been some recent studies on that where the folks have looked at uh, pH levels in and around a cultivated seaweed farm uh, before the harvest, during the harvest, and afterwards to see the difference that growing seaweed makes. And when you think about it, uh, holistically, I I'm sure decades ago, 
uh, our our coastal ocean was loaded with seaweed. And, and anecdotally, and the science tells us it is decreasing and for obvious reasons. So let's start putting it back. In fact, your listeners yeah. may be interested to post some great, uh, a great historical view uh, of coastal peoples coming from Asia in the land bridge after the last ice age following the kelp trail. Hmm. Essentially, what it boils down to is, is looking at, at the bounty that nature provided in the coastal ocean. And following that food trail around is where people's reached out uh, in harmony with their environment. And we've we've uh, we've damaged, obviously, that relationship in the last couple of hundred years. And this time we we, uh, we fixed it. Yeah. And just to sort of restate, that's where, you know, from us uh, at the Salmon Foundation have such a strong interest in, in seeing how your industry emerges, because our research, of course, shows that we have lost a lot of that. Uh, underground forestation, near shore estuary, uh, kelp, eelgrass, that is so critical for those young salmon when they're coming out of the freshwater to hide for nutrients. Uh, we think it's been a major factor in uh, declines that we've seen in salmon in the last last 20 years. Let's switch a little bit, uh, you know, at the Salmon Foundation, we're our number one and only constituent are the wild salmon. <laughs> That's who we're, we're looking out for. And there seems to be a very positive story for uh, improving the health of the ocean and 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 the health of salmon potentially through this uh, long term, but this is obviously situated your your work in the broader industry of aquaculture. There's a lot going on. Uh, federal government has committed to move to uh, away from open net pen aquaculture for fin fish salmon, which we have supported based on our our science. Uh, of course, there's also uh, shellfish aquaculture. You've talked about seaweed as being the the other, the other uh, leg on the stool. Uh, mm -hmm. Give us a sense of of uh, you know how you're uh, participating in these discussions and processes as as what sounds to be to, like a nascent industry that's trying to to get going here. And so, how are you trying to influence? I guess the policy framework. There's an Aquaculture mm -hmm. Act being considered federally, uh, mm -hmm. and and really, I think if you could tell us too. What's the potential for British Columbia? Uh, we've talked a lot about the biodiversity and, and, and things that might be good for salmon and, and ocean health, but uh, there's always the balance. You know, salmon are part of fisheries, which have economic values. The coastal communities have long been a part of our history. Talk to us a bit about that broader sort of political and economic uh, context for your industry. Right, so we've looked at, uh, at the, I'll start with the economics. Uh, economics, we're a for-profit organization that drives things, but uh, but not at the expense of planet or people. So, so the economics tells us that that we think uh, seaweed aquaculture could generate a billion dollars extra in the GDP of British Columbia, and we're limited by uh, by government in terms of uh, licensing, speed of licensing. And of course, the balance is always uh, speed of licensing versus paying attention to the important things. We have to do it in a, in a correct manner that's in harmony with competing activities in the coastal zone, as well as making sure that we have at, at the fore uh, the concerns for the environment. We don't want to take two steps backward for every one step forward in this area. And I'll say to your listeners, uh, we acknowledge that any time you're putting any infrastructure in the water, you are making an impact. Yeah. The question is how much and is it possible to be mitigated? In terms of policy, uh, we, we're we trying to push all levels of government to, to innovate. Uh, government for years is telling industry to innovate. Well, now industry is saying, okay, in support of the outgrowth of this new sector, which is new, this new high protein food stuff that can enter the North American uh, uh, food, uh, food chain and be extremely beneficial to humans and other animals, uh, we have an opportunity here. Time is not on our side, though. We see every day CO2 uh, um, increases in the atmosphere. We see habitats being lost every day. So we don't have time to waste. We can't wait to change the planet. So we need government to innovate and to help us build, a, build uh, the support structures necessary in coastal communities. Uh, I'll give you an example. PICFI is a wonderful opportunity for indigenous uh, uh, nations to acquire support from the federal government in support of aquaculture. But it's grossly underfunded. 
a million dollars last year, I think in 2020, to support how much opportunity exists in the coastal zone for people to get back on the water in their coastal communities to to decentralize from these uh, these these uh, people hubs into more traditional spaces that they would live and work and may have meaningful jobs, meaningful green jobs. This is possible mm. if we get innovation from all levels of government to help expediently deal with things such as tenures and licensing and the other things that need to we, we need the regulatory structures that we need to have in place. Mm. So we get asked this question all the time from international folks. Well, what's what's it like in Canada trying to do this? And we say um, we've got a ways to go. We know there's willingness on all sides to make this happen. That that's one thing that we can rely on. And in the next couple of years, I, as a as a as an, a person and a company looking for investment, I have to be able to say, look, here's the actions that have happened in the last two years to demonstrate to you that we may not be there yet, but we will get there. And that's a really important point that that we continue to and. Uh, Form the discussions with government. Mm. We're very optimistic we wouldn't be here today. We'd, we'd go to Europe or the East Coast uh, or in the States where seaweed cultivation is being given tremendous amount of financial and other support within government. But we believe it can be done here. We believe this is the place to do it. And we'd like to take this model to the rest of the world given the opportunity. Well, you got me with the one billion <laughs> yeah. uh, potential yeah. and that's annual potential uh, revenues, I'm assuming yeah. across the industry. What, what's the em employment picture? We know that uh, with the transition from open net pen, there is concern, obviously, uh, about jobs. Uh, yep. This sounds like you're saying this is potentially a transition uh, opportunity economically. Does that include potential for employment? You mentioned indigenous communities as well. Very much so. Uh, this is a very hyper local activity. We have to be in our supply chain and our value chain. We have to recognize that you can't do everything at a local level. We have to have processing hubs. For example, uh, we have to get our product to market efficiently, cost effectively. But it does represent an, an opportunity for more jobs uh, in, 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 in bays and coves and, uh, and greater uh, out, outflow of, of jobs in the communities. Uh, you talk about jobs. Well, we have gone on record saying, well, Cascadia and we're both directs and indirects. We could, if we're allowed to have the licensing and, and can work out agreements with our First Nation partners, uh, we could hire 300 people. Uh, but I will point to a, another study of recently out of Europe in November of last year, which talked about economic impact of seaweed cultivation in Europe. And they talk about 85,000 jobs, mm. new jobs, green jobs coming to Europe through coastal seaweed cultivation. Now, Europe, give or take uh, Norway, uh, has about 68,000 kilometers of coastline. So if you say, OK, well, if 68,000 kilometers of coastline can generate 85,000 jobs, then the coastline of BC with 25,000 kilometers, we should be able to generate 30,000 jobs <laughs> if you did the math. Now, I'm not saying, you know, uh, coastal Europe is way more populated than coastal BC, which is why we should be doing seaweed cultivation here because of the beautiful, pristine waters. I'm not saying we're going to end up with 30,000 jobs. I'd be happy with 300. I'm sure the number is greater than that, but we have to, uh, to be careful when we're we don't want to tout this as the silver bullet, Mike, as you mentioned. Mm. It, it is a clear, uh, we have a clear path to have being successful. It's coming to the execution and the partnerships between government to government, First Nations to our federal government, and then business to business for the dev side of the First Nations and companies like Cascadia. There will be more of us. We welcome it because in, you, a sector of one company does not make a sector. Yeah. Well, and Bill, you've been good at reaching out to the conservation community as well as you have done with the Pacific Salmon Foundation, which is why I wanted to have you on to talk about the science, uh, the potential for salmon and the broader ocean health. This has been a fascinating conversation. Uh, Bill Collins with Cascadia Seaweed and, as I said, one of the founders of the industry group, the Pacific Seaweed Growers Association. Keep us posted on, on how things are going. And, and thanks for all that stream keeping work you've been doing there on the Saanich Peninsula. Bill, thanks Excellent. for joining us. You're more than welcome, Mike. Thank you. Well, that'll be it for this edition of Salmon Matter. Thank you very much for joining us. We'll keep 
producing these Salmon Matter episodes to keep you up on all that's going on in the salmon world. Uh, I'm Mike Manier. Again, this is a co-production with Conversations That Matter and the Pacific Salmon Foundation. Thank you.